Welcome to Learn This Game, where you can learn about board games and how they are played. Today, we'll be looking at Vikings Scourge of the North. In this video, there will be a general description and overview of the game. We'll inventory the components, and we'll go through gameplay, including setup, sample turns, and victory conditions. Lastly, we'll review any accessories you may find helpful for this game. In the description, there will be some helpful links. There will also be a timestamp index so you can navigate directly to any part of the presentation. If you want to skip this introduction and go straight to the game setup and gameplay, you can go to the timestamp index now. And if you find this video helpful, please like, subscribe, and share. And you can also leave a comment to let us know what game you would like to see Learn This Game review. Vikings was first published by Decision Games in 2018 and was designed by Joseph Miranda. In this solitaire game, you'll be leading a band of Vikings in pursuit of gold, glory, and new lands to settle. This is a physically small game measuring 9 by 6 inches wide, and it comes in a plastic bag. An age recommendation was not provided, but the difficulty level was listed as very low complexity. Each saga should take about 60 to 90 minutes to play. This game was designed for solitaire play only. There are no official multiplayer variants. An app is not required to play, and there are no other apps available for this game. There are no expansions, but the same publisher has several games in their mini-game series, many of which are designed for solitaire play. And if you like this game, you can check out Learn This Game's videos about Long Range Desert Group and Congo Mark, which are other games in the mini-game series. The links will be in the description. Game designer Joseph Miranda has many design credits to his name, including Zulus on the Ramparts and Empires in America. An internet search will help you locate many more games by this designer. If you want to further explore the Viking theme, you can check out these other games. You can also check out these books if you want to learn more about Vikings and their place in history. Now that you've seen a brief description of the game, let's get into the game itself. Vikings is a solitaire, card-driven game using a map, mini cards, counters, and dice. Thematically, it's set in the later years of the Dark Ages in Europe when Vikings explored, pillaged, traded, and colonized. The player controls the Vikings. This is meant to be a historically accurate game. Now let's see how a game is won. Each game is called a saga, and you will draw one saga card that sets the parameters for the game. Each card shows the objectives and quests you must complete to successfully finish the saga. The saga card we will be using states that we must establish two settlements, one of which must be in a certain geographical space. We must also encounter and successfully complete one quest as indicated by a quest marker. We must also have at least one Viking leader known as a Jarl in a homeland or settlement space by the end of the saga. We lose if we run out of voyage cards or all of our units are eliminated. We also lose if there are no leaders, known as Jarls, left on the map at the end of playing a voyage card. The success part of the card only applies at the end of the saga if we are playing this saga as part of a bigger campaign. You can also play all four sagas as part of a campaign. You win the campaign when you have won all the sagas. You lose the campaign if you lose any saga twice, or lose two different sagas once each. You also lose the campaign if all four leaders are killed before you finish the last saga. Now let's take a look at the components. The game comes with one 8-page color rulebook. There are 40 small counters, the green units of the Vikings you'll be playing. There are six settlement counters used to fulfill victory requirements. The red counters are the enemy units. The purple counters are the quests that are also completed to meet victory conditions. There is one unmounted paper map measuring 17 by 11 inches. The point-to-point -point map has the tables and charts you will be using during the game. There are four saga cards that are mini-sized. There are also 14 voyage cards that you will be drawing as you play your saga. All cards are numbered on the bottom right for inventory purposes. You will need to provide up to six of your own six-sided dice. These are not included in the game. You will also need to provide an opaque container for placing the red enemy counters. You can also place the counters face down and shuffle them for randomness. Now let's set up the game for play. 
We'll be playing a complete saga, which will include showing how recruiting, movement, and combat are conducted. First, unfold and lay out the map. Next, place the dice next to the map. Then, place the red enemy counters into the draw container. Next, draw the saga card for the game and place it face up near the map. Let's take a closer look at the saga card since it will show how to set up the rest of the game. The purpose of this specific saga is to explore new lands and establish settlements. The first icon shows us how many voyage cards to draw after shuffling the voyage deck. For this saga, we draw seven and place them face down near the map. A voyage card is drawn each turn, so they act like a game counter. If you run out of voyage cards, the saga ends. Throughout the game, you may be gaining or losing voyage cards, so the duration of the game will vary each time you play. The remaining cards will be the reserve deck and are also placed face down near the map. Reserve cards may be drawn throughout the game as dictated by other voyage cards. The next icon shows that we are provided 8 gold at the start of this saga. We place the gold marker on the gold track. Gold can never go below 0 or above 19. Any gold not spent during the initial deployment can be saved to recruit units later in the game. Next, we place the Edda marker on 0 on the Edda track. Edda measures our reputation level. The rulebook and voyage cards do not specify where to place the Edda marker at the start of the saga, so we will set it at 0. Reputation is gained and lost as the Vikings explore and become known for their actions. Next, we see that we must establish two settlements, one of which must be in either Vinland or Greenland near the top of the map. We can place the six settlement markers in the box on the bottom right of the map until ready for use. The saga card also indicates that we must successfully encounter and complete one of the six quest markers that will be placed on the map. There are six quest counters, each with a different reward if successfully completed. Note that the runes quest marker does not count as an accomplished quest, but does let you reveal another quest on the map. To place the quest markers, we must first turn them over to the side that is labeled quest and shuffle them for randomness. To determine where to place the quest markers, we consult the random location placement table at the top right of the map. We roll two dice to consult the table. If we roll a six, for example, we place the initial quest markers face down on the spaces indicated on the table. We then roll again to place the remaining two quest markers. If we roll the same number, we must continue rolling until we obtain a new unique number since there can only be one quest marker in a space. The second roll is a 9, which shows three places indicated on the table, but we only have two quest markers remaining. If there are fewer markers remaining than indicated spaces, then we can randomly decide which places will receive the quest markers. We can disregard the success portion of the saga card since it only applies to the campaign game. Rule 23 on page 8 of the rulebook states that at the start of play, we must select the old or new religion scenario in order to perform a special role later in the game. If you select the new Christian religion, you cannot recruit berserkers in the saga. Since we may want to recruit berserkers in this saga, we elect the old religion. This will require us to roll a die against the Berserker table at the conclusion of the first battle in which a Berserker participates, regardless of the outcome. Had we chosen the new Christian religion scenario, we would not be able to recruit Berserkers, but we would have the option of rolling against the new religion table after the conclusion of the first battle in which a Jarl participated, regardless of the outcome. Before we recruit our units, let's take a look at the unit types. There are four leaders, or Jarls, each leader also has a unique ability which is shown on the right side of the map in blue boxes. The blue boxes are also areas where you can place units following the Jarl in order to save map space. The white number is the combat number, and any unit with a plus sign is considered an elite unit. The basic Viking fighting unit in this game is the Huskarl with a combat value of 3. There are two types of special units, the Berserker and the Varangian. During the first round of battle, you ignore one hit for each Berserker engaged in the force, then apply hits normally in subsequent rounds. Varangians can only be recruited if you have a Jarl in a space with a Warrior Kingdom symbol, where you must also pass an edit check. There are two types of naval units. The white number is both the combat factor and the number of units it can carry. The Ormer is an elite unit indicated by the plus sign, and the long ship has a combat and carrying capacity of 2. Both ships have the letter N to denote they are naval units. Now we can recruit our units for gameplay. We will consult the recruiting chart to determine the cost of each unit. Recall that we start with 8 gold per the saga card. 
First, we randomly select a Jarl which has no gold cost. Each Jarl has a bonus ability listed in the blue boxes on the map. In this case, we gain one extra gold point for each pillage. Since we have to voyage over the sea to place settlements, we can purchase one longship for three gold. We then recruit two Huskarls for a total of four gold. This leaves one gold remaining which we can use later in the game to recruit additional units or spend for other uses. We place the unused remaining Viking units in an area to the right of the map. The gold marker is moved to one on the gold track since we spent seven gold recruiting. We can place the Jarl Eric in a Viking homeland indicated by a yellow rectangle. We can then place the units in the Jarl's blue box to show they are voyaging with this leader. We are now ready to begin gameplay. Before we start playing the game, there are two terms that need to be explained. The first is force. A force is a group of units in the same space conducting a voyage together. A force can be one or more units up to the stacking limit. Only one force can conduct one voyage at a time. The force conducting the voyage is known as the voyaging force. You may also see the rulebook and voyage cards refer to the voyaging force as the operating force or the adventuring force. The second term is stacking. Stacking is having more than one unit in a single space. In a single space, you may have four Viking units plus the number equal to the Edda or reputation level. Stacking units do not apply to settlement, pillaged, or quest markers, or to hostile units. There cannot be more than one quest marker in a space, and a space cannot have both a pillaged and a settlement marker. The stacking limit is checked at the end of the movement segment. If there are excess units in the space, they must be eliminated. Otherwise, any number of units may move through a space. Stacking does not apply to homeland spaces, which may contain an unlimited number of units. Each voyage is broken into seven segments, which will be posted in the upper left of the screen for future reference. We are now ready to start the first voyage. The first segment is the trade segment. In this segment, we receive one gold if the voyaging force is in a trade center space with a settlement. You can consult the terrain key on the map to see where the trade centers are. Since this does not apply at this time, we can move to the recruiting phase. Since we only have one gold, we cannot recruit units at this time. We then advance to the movement segment. In the movement segment, we can declare a land or naval move. Since we will be moving towards a quest marker on mainland Europe, we will make a sea move towards Kurland. At this point, we have a total of four units. The longship only has a carrying capacity of two land units, so we will form a force consisting of the Jarl Eric, a Huskarl, and the longship. We will have to leave one Huskarl behind in the homeland, and this unit will be removed from the blue box on the right side of the map since it will not be voyaging with the Jarl. To make a naval move, we roll one die and divide by two to see how many spaces we can move. We have the option of moving all of the allowed spaces, a portion of the spaces, or no spaces at all. In this case, we roll one die and receive a four. If four divided by two is two, so we can move zero, one, or two spaces. Since there are white lines indicating sea lanes from our current homeland location to the coastal town of Kurland, we can move two spaces to Kurland, which also has a quest marker. A moving force must also stop in a space that contains a quest marker, regardless if it is face up or face down. If we voyage through any sea spaces indicated by the white circles per the terrain key, we must roll one die to check for sea storms. In this case, we roll a two, then add the number of sea spaces we entered, in this case one. This gives us a total of three. We can subtract one if we have a Jarl as part of the voyaging force, which gives us a final total of two. If we end up with a result of six or more, we must lose one unit of our choice. Otherwise, we do not lose any units. That concludes the movement segment. It is now time to draw a voyage card from the voyage deck. We draw the Encounter Voyage card, which instructs us to roll one die and consult the table on the card. We roll a four, which grants us two gold, so we can move the gold marker to the three space on the gold track. We then place the Voyage card on the discard pile. We then move to the Combat segment. Since the Voyage card did not initiate combat, we can skip this segment for this voyage. We then move to the Quest segment. We must complete the quest segment since we encountered a quest marker. First, we flip the quest marker over. We see that it is the Jomsburg quest. In order to accomplish any quest, we must engage in a round of combat, even if we already engaged in combat after the voyage card segment. If we succeed in combat, this particular quest will allow us to place a settlement in the space at no cost. 
The quest rewards are listed in Rule 18.4. Per the recruiting chart, it would normally cost 2 gold to place a settlement. We now conduct our first combat engagement of the saga. First, we have to determine the number of hostile units. We do this by rolling one die, dividing by half, and then rounding up. In this case, we roll a four, which divided by two requires us to draw two enemy units. We place the enemy units in descending order from highest combat number to lowest. If the combat numbers are the same, the order does not matter. We then place our Viking units in any order we prefer, keeping in mind that the enemy units will be firing at the first active Viking unit in line. Next, we determine who has the tactical edge. The side with the tactical edge gets to attack first. Combat is not considered simultaneous, so if a unit is eliminated, it does not get to fight back before being removed from the combat segment. Before we roll for the tactical edge, we have the option of reducing our Edda level by 1 to add 1 to our die roll. Since we have no Edda at this time, we will not have this choice for this combat segment. To determine which side has the tactical edge for this round of combat, we roll one die for each side. The terrain effects chart on the left side of the map shows who wins the tactical edge if there is a tie. Since we are in a coastal town, the Vikings will win any ties. Recall that the plus sign designates an elite unit. If either side has more elite units in the force than the other side, a one is added to that side's die roll. Regardless of the number of elite units present, no more than one can be added to a die roll. In this case, the Vikings have one elite unit and the hostile forces have zero. So a 1 is added to the 3, resulting in a 4. In this case, the Vikings win the tie and get to attack first. We then proceed to the first round of battle. Again, the hostiles are lined up in descending order of combat power, and the Vikings can be ordered at our discretion. Since the Vikings have the tactical edge, we get to attack first. When the Vikings are attacking, we use our first unit to fire at any of the hostile units of our choice. We fire the first unit, which is a Huskarl with a combat strength of 3. We elect to target the most powerful hostile unit available. To fire a unit, we roll one die. If the die result is equal to or less than the attacking unit's combat strength, it eliminates the enemy unit. In this case, the die roll of 3 eliminates the target enemy unit. Because combat is not simultaneous, the defeated unit does not get to return fire and is eliminated immediately. Attacks alternate between sides. Enemy units do not get to select a target and must fire at the first Viking unit in line. The enemy unit rolls a 6, which is greater than its combat strength of 1, so it is unsuccessful. The next Viking unit in line is the Jarl Eric. The leader rolls a 6, which is greater than its combat strength of 4, so this attack is also unsuccessful. If one side has more units, after alternating fire has been completed, that side can fire its remaining units. Since the Vikings have one more unit that hasn't attacked yet, and the enemy has no more units eligible to fire this turn, the longship gets to attack next. It rolls a 1, which is equal to or less than its combat strength of 2, so the enemy unit is eliminated. If both sides still had units, another round of combat would begin, starting with rolling for tactical edge. In this case, combat is over since there are no enemy units remaining. Since we were successful in combat and have forces remaining in the space, we accomplished the quest. When a quest is accomplished, the marker is placed next to the edit track at the top of the map. Rule 18.4 describes the unique reward of each quest. Accomplishing the Jomsburg quest allows us to place a settlement in the space at no cost. Recall that per the recruiting chart, it would normally cost 2 gold to establish a settlement. We now move to the pillage and settlement segment. Since we just placed a settlement and cannot have more than one in a space, the voyage is now over. In reviewing the Saga card victory requirements, we see that we have accomplished one quest and one settlement. We still need to establish one more settlement, but it must be in either Greenland or Vinland at the top left of the map so we must prepare for a long sea voyage to reach the distant destinations. We will use the same force for the next voyage. We now start another voyage with the trade segment. The force is not in a trade center with a settlement, so does not receive one gold. Next is the recruiting segment. When recruiting Viking units, we must place recruited units in a Viking homeland, settlement, or with a leader. Naval units must be placed on coasts or rivers. 
We have three gold to spend on recruiting Viking units, and we can add recruits to the current force since it has a leader and is in a settlement. Looking at the recruiting chart, we see that for three gold, we have enough to purchase a Berserker which has a special fighting ability. Recall that the stacking limit is four Viking units plus our edit count. Since our edit count is zero, we currently only have a stacking limit of four. However, although we only have three units in the current force and the stacking limit is four, we only have one longship that can carry two units. So we would have to leave one unit behind if we recruited a Berserker if traveling by sea. Therefore, in order to maximize our stacking limit for sea travel, we can instead purchase another longship for three gold, since we will need to voyage by sea to establish our second settlement. We move the gold marker to zero since we have spent our last three gold. We then add one longship to our voyaging force, which brings our stack to four units. Next, we proceed to the movement segment. We will move the force by sea towards Greenland, where we will attempt to establish our second settlement in order to win the saga. Since we are declaring a naval movement, we roll one die and divide by two to determine how many sea spaces we can move. We roll a four and divide by two, which allows us to move two sea spaces. Since we traveled by at least one sea space, we have to roll a die to check for storms. We roll a five and add the number of sea spaces entered, which in this case is two, giving us a total of seven. We do get to subtract one since we have a leader in the force, leaving us a total of six. Unfortunately, a result of six or greater requires us to eliminate a unit of our choice. We eliminate a naval unit since it is not needed for carrying units and has a lower combat strength than the leader and Huskarl. If a ship is eliminated in a sea space, any transported units in excess of the remaining carrying capacity are also eliminated. We next move to the Voyage Card segment. Whenever we end a turn in a sea space, we still draw a Voyage Card, but we have to discard it immediately and instead perform another Storm Check. We roll a 1 and add the two sea spaces entered, then deduct 1 for our Jarl, resulting in 2, which is less than 6, so we do not lose any forces. Since we are still at sea, we will skip the combat segment since we had to discard the voyage card, and we'll also skip the quest and pillage settlement segments since these cannot be conducted at sea. We will now start a new voyage starting with the trade segment. This has no effect since we are not in a trade center with a settlement. We then move to the recruiting segment, but since we have no gold, we will then proceed to the movement segment. We declare a naval move. We roll one die and divide by two to determine our movement allowance. We roll a six, divide by two, and determine we can move three spaces. We then move our force three spaces towards Greenland, once again ending in a sea space. We perform a storm check and roll a three. We add three sea spaces just moved, which gives us a six, and then subtract one for the Jarl, finally resulting in five, which fortunately is less than six, so we do not lose any units. We move to the Voyage Card segment. Since we ended another turn in a sea space, we must draw and discard one Voyage Card. Instead of reading the card, we then conduct another Storm Check. We roll a 2. We add the three sea spaces entered and deduct one for the Jarl, resulting in 4, which again is less than 6, so no units are lost. Since we are still at sea, we can skip the remaining segments and start our next voyage with the Trade segment. Once again, we do not have any units in a trade space with a settlement. We can also skip the recruiting segment again since we still do not have any gold. This brings us back to the movement segment. Since the white line from our current position to Greenland indicates a sea route, we must declare a naval move to get to Greenland. Since we only need to move one space, we will not need to roll a die since a die roll will always result in allowing one to three movement spaces. We also do not have to roll for a storm check since we are not entering any sea spaces this turn. We now move into the Greenland space where we will try to establish a settlement and fulfill our last victory requirement. We now proceed to the voyage card segment. At this point, we still have four voyage cards left in the voyage deck out of the original seven. Next, we draw a voyage card. The voyage card tells us that we must proceed to the combat segment of the voyage. First, we determine the number of hostile units by rolling a die and dividing by two and rounding up. The enemy rolls a five, which allows them to draw three units. 
They are placed in line from highest to weakest combat strength. We then place our Viking units in any order, recalling that the enemy units will always attack our first unit in line. Next, we determine tactical edge. We roll one die for each side. Since the enemy has more elite units as indicated by their plus signs, they will get a plus one to their die roll. The enemy gains the tactical edge for this round of combat since it has the higher number, so it gets to attack first. The first enemy unit attacks the first Viking unit in line. It must roll a four or less to succeed. The enemy rolls a two, which eliminates the Viking unit. The leader Eric then elects to fire at the most powerful unit. Eric must roll a 4 or less to succeed. Eric rolls a 1 so eliminates the enemy unit. Fire alternates between sides so the next enemy unit fires at the next viking unit in line. The enemy unit must roll a 3 or less to succeed. It rolls a 3 and eliminates the viking leader. Rule 11.2 lists three conditions that cause the saga to end. One, we accomplish the victory conditions or two, we run out of voyage cards, or three, we have no Jarls left on the map. Certain voyage cards will recruit a Jarl at the end of a battle which negates the third condition and allows the game to continue. However, the current voyage card will not allow us to recruit a Jarl at the end of combat, so the saga ends since we have no Jarls remaining on the map and no chance of recruiting another by the end of this voyage. Therefore, the saga is a failure. So let's recap the victory and loss conditions. In this saga, we were able to complete one quest. However, we were only able to establish one settlement instead of the two required. We also failed to keep at least one Jarl on the map. Therefore, the saga was a failure. If you were playing the saga as part of the campaign and you were successful, you would consult the success item to see what you would gain for the next saga. Now here are a few ideas for accessories if you want to enhance your gaming experience. If you are playing on a dining room or coffee table, you may want to invest in a game mat. They are relatively inexpensive but make gameplay much easier, and of course you can use the mats for many other games. You do have to provide your own six-sided dice or obtain a dice rolling app, many of which are free from Google or Apple. And of course a good dice tray could come in handy, especially in this game if you choose to roll physical dice. This concludes our review of Vikings. Visit us at these sites and don't forget to leave a comment on what games you would like to see reviewed and played. And if you would like to experience something greater than pillaging the coast of medieval Europe, stick around for our disclaimer. Coming up next!